Welcome to episode 67 of the Series About Security podcast for December 11th, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined again by Mike Hill and Keith Watson. And Mike will start out uh, this week. Yes, um, I have an important statement to make here. I was wrong during last week's podcast. Uh, we had a bit of a tangent conversation on last pass where I basically described how I'm cheap and I wouldn't pay for it. Um, but I wanted two-factor verification. Um, so after the podcast, I went back and I looked more at at, uh, at LastPass, and it turns out that you now can enable two-factor verification on the free account, uh, which I have done. Uh, so I just wanted to issue an apology to LastPass. I, I do think it's a great product. Um, I, I really do. Uh, like I said, I'm still on the free account, but I, uh, the point I was trying to make last week was irrelevant, it turned out. Uh, they do allow their free users to have two-factor verification. So I applaud that effort. Uh, I don't know exactly when they open that up, but it is now, it is available now, and uh, I'm using it, so I just wanted to uh, clarify on that issue um, before jumping into the first article, so. Are you using Google Authenticator or a uh, YubiKey? I am, I am using Google Authenticator. I, I do have a YubiKey. That was another thing I was impressed with. It looked like they had a number of options for two-factor, uh, about half a dozen. Um, but I, I like Google Authenticator, so I used it. Um, but yeah, I was impressed with the number of two-factor options they had as well. So like I said, I really uh, do issue <laughs> an apology there. I think it's a great product, and I can endorse it more now. <laughs> um, and you know, if you weren't such a cheapskate... If I wasn't uh, such a cheapskate, I should reward their efforts I should for reward developing their such an awesome product. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably getting very close to that. Um, because it would be nice to have it... The way I run it on my mobile devices is I log into their site. Um, it would be nice to have the apps, and I believe I would get access to that with the paid yep. account. So, um, is it twelve dollars a year? So yes. essentially a dollar. I think a so. Month? Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I may be going that route now. <laughs> All right. Good. <laughs> All right. So, speaking of passwords, <laughs> the the article I decided to talk about this week is on the. Uh, nuclear launch code um, and the, the uh, launch code that they used for uh, nearly 15 years between 1962 to 1977 it turns out to be um, it's an eight-digit number uh, but not a very complicated one it was all zeros so um, this was a re I believe this was originally revealed um, back in 2004 there was uh, an article written at that time but it's gotten back into the press, into the news here recently, so I thought it would be an interesting one to explore. Um, so yeah, basically everyone that worked in those silos knew that the code was to be all zeros, and uh, there was even, uh, not only was it all zeros, but I believe it was just written down, you know, make sure that the digits are, are always set to zero so that you will be able to launch the missile in case of an attack. Um, from what I've been able to uh, read between the lines with, with these articles are that um, you know the, the White House administration you know passed a thing in 1962 1963 um, where these permissive action link codes would be used and it turns out that the the folks at the on the ground level the ones that were being forced to use these codes immediately set those codes to zero um, and what I can infer from it is that the uh, they didn't like being told, you know, to use this extra layer of security. It would, it would slow them down. I think, you know, this was the Cold War climate. It was like, I don't need an extra layer. You know, I don't need to wait on somebody to tell me what the code is. You know, if, if we're under attack, we're going to attack, and we need to be able to attack. So I look at it as, um, you know, kind of the administration that was in place at that time, you know, they were used to doing it a certain way. They were used to always having that power, you know, being – able to just push that button, you know, to say launch, and they, they didn't want this extra layer added to them. So or, they, or the complexity of it, where or the it complexity. fail at the yeah. most inopportune yeah. moment. Yeah, they didn't want a failure point. You know, they, they really were, and 
you know, we're looking back on, on many years ago, so I, I don't want to second guess them. I mean, maybe in, in some ways they had a very valid point. I mean, we weren't in their position. Well, it's true. <laughs> and, and, and none of the three of us were alive during, like, the Cuban Missile Crisis or many of the tough interactions the U.S. had with the Soviet Union at the time. So, so our, our understanding of what happened at that time is based on what we've read in history books, not so much having firsthand experience yeah. with it either. Or, or what we've grown up, I mean, I grew up in, you know, the 80s with the, the movies on the Cold War and, right. you know, uh, the, the, you know, break the thing, get the code, two key, must turn keys, turn your, key, turn your sir. key, sir, you know, simultaneously. Um, so I think we grew up with this idea, this notion that these codes were super secretive and protected. I, I think it, the article even mentioned how the presidents at the time, you know, walked around with this briefcase where the code was supposed to be. In that they still, case. in theory, walk around with a briefcase. The case. Case. Well, the football. yeah, yeah. Um, where you know that's that's the code that's going to that, that will launch the missiles, and uh, at least for that fifteen-year stretch, that wasn't really the case. Um, so I, I think you know it, it's interesting, and, and perhaps it's come back up in the news because it is a it's a newer generation that's learning about all of this as well. Um, but, but what, what I'd like to look at is, you know, the fact that, you know, from a, you know, other examples like this probably exist every day in our workplace. Um, not probably with as high as stakes on the line, you know, but in, in general, you know, this was a policy, you know, this was made at the executive level to say, you're going to use this. And, and basically they said, okay, I mean, they had no choice, they had to use it, but they essentially defeated it by saying, well, we'll make it a code that uh, is easy and that everybody knows. So it, effectively, they, they removed that security control. Um, and I think as security professionals, that's one of, the, one of the challenges in our field is even if we can go up to management and get kind of that executive order that says, um, you will password protect your flash drives. Oh, okay, I'll make my password zero, 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 zero. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> so I, I think this, this is a really good, probably an over-the-top example of how, you know, poli a policy is only as good as its implementation, you know, the follow-through on it, which I believe ultimately and happened in 1977. Sure, and there's the verification, right? That's also a good part of implementing security controls to make sure it's working correctly. And apparently that didn't happen. There weren't, weren't audits going out to these silos and saying, yeah, what is the security code here? Oh, it's that, that's not right. Or why aren't you following this particular procedure and process that we've already established? You know, that didn't appear to happen, or if it did, it was suppressed in some way, or some of the general higher up the chain uh, altered the data, or who knows what happened. But yeah, it was yeah. The zeros for a long time. Yeah, I think, you know, um, we can look back now and we can say, oh, you know, man, we're, we're very lucky. But it could have created a really very, very bad situation had one of those uh, missiles been launched, you know, without authorization, uh, armed or not. It could right. have created a really well, tragic situation. One movie I remember is Dr. Strangelove. And there was a, uh, a warning at the beginning of the movie that said, there were controls in place to prevent yes. something like this from occurring. Yes. And, well, having all zeros, you know, isn't a great control. Right. It, I mean, obviously, we're talking about a slightly different situation. Sure. But, but in, in the end, I remember in the war room that they said he obviously exceeded his authority. Well, yeah, if you, yeah. If you know the codes are all zeros, then you obviously could, could exceed your authority. And I think maybe in, in a way that was somewhat of the point is that if if the command structure was was not there, somebody could launch the missiles, and right. if if the, if need be, and that was that was right. A concern. Yeah, yeah, that was the you know if if Washington D.C. got blown up in an attack from the sea, it would be a, such a short response time and no command structure then in place to say go ahead and launch that they felt, well, if we knew Washington, D.C. got wiped out, there was no commander-in-chief to give us an order, so we'll just launch on our own independently. And so that, I think, is part of the concern. Yeah. The other is they were talking specifically about 
uh, missiles based in Turkey and Greece. And those were close enough to the Soviet Union. So if the Soviet Union actually attacked Turkey and Greece and were able to uh, you know, get access to the silos, that they could somehow modify those missiles and launch them, use them as their own weapons to attack Europe or the United States. It probably wouldn't reach that far, but uh, certainly attack parts of Europe, attack bases in Europe, for example. And so I think that was part of the concern, too. So this idea of having this rapid response in the face of an attack was also uh, yeah. part of their thinking. Well, and, you know, like I said, to kind of get back to the policy issue, um, it, it's important to have buy-in. Sure. You know, the, 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 the generals on the ground, the commanders on the ground that were tasked with this, that had to live with this day in, day out in this environment, and not an easy environment at all. I mean, clearly, the stress they must have been under. Sure. Um, like you said, they, they felt there were valid reasons, and maybe they could have given them buy-in. Maybe they could have said, you know, May, they could have come up, they could have reassured them, you know, came up or maybe came up with a slightly different solution that they were comfortable with because, like I said, without that buy in, they essentially didn't have that buy in up front. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and they, they bypassed it because they, they felt, I, I believe they felt something was taken away from them, something they always had was just now removed. They were suddenly demoted, and, and I think they yes. felt that way in their eyes. Well, wait, I've always had this capability, and you're taking it away from me. Um, and you know, I've, I've grown into this position to believe that I'm the one, ultimately, that can make this. You know, that, that needs to push this button when the time comes. Like you said, if, if Washington gets wiped out, it's my responsibility. You know, it's my responsibility to launch. Mm -hmm. um, and if you cr create this situation, I'm not going to be able to. And, and we'll lose our we'll country. Lose, we'll lose our country. <laughs> we'll lose. Yeah. 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 Um, so. Now I was going to say that the talking about policy, if you look. The, the actual memorandum from the president, this is National Security Action Memorandum Number 160, is only about four paragraphs long. And then that, those four paragraphs which define, you know, here's the permissive action links requirement, go to make it go, that spurns off all, spurs off all this other activity and budgeting and, and research and development to actually go and implement all this stuff too. And there's a lot of ways that could all fall apart between four paragraphs of statement and actual implementation. And I think this is a good example of where that did. So yeah, there's more to it than just creating policy. Right, right. I mean, I think, I think this is a perfect example of that. There's yeah. the, the follow-up, the follow-through. Like I said, in the buy-in, the buy-in's key. You know, the, the people you're applying the policy to need to, need to buy into it, or they're gonna find ways around it. You mm -hmm. know? Um, like I said, if you, if you just put out a blanket policy, you know, you will, you know, you will encrypt your data on flash drives with the password. Okay, well, I'll make my password one. <laughs> right. That, that, that also <laughs> brings up another issue of having overly complex security controls and users finding ways to bypass them. I think it's another way, another way to look at it, too. If it's too hard to use, they'll find simpler ways that, that, that violate security <laughs> in different right. ways, too. So right. another concern. And, and I imagine the technology today probably makes us all people are probably a lot more comfortable with it because the technology today is a lot more advanced than it was those many years ago. So um, I would imagine today there's a lot of safeguards in place even if Washington goes offline. You know, there's the immediate communication essentially. You know, you, right. you know. We have better awareness of better what's awareness, going on in yeah. a lot of cases. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. You can, All right. Do you understand? So the next article uh, <coughs> is really about Google discovering that um, there was an intermediate CA uh, being used um, by a security device, and they basically went in and modified the um, certificates within the the Chrome certificate revocation system. So what's interesting about this is the kind of the backstory. So if you go, we have a link to the actual Google online security blog, which is kind of vague, but it does cite that a French uh, security authority, I'm sorry, French certificate authority um, had used intermediate CA certificates to create these uh, kind of meta certificates, if you will, to allow uh, a security device to act as a man in the middle so that you could actually audit the information passing over an encrypted session. Now, the reason why we might want to do that is that uh, 
from a security perspective, encrypted traffic you can't see. So from, it's encrypted all the way to the endpoints. And so if you're trying to monitor the security of your network and you want to catch people uploading uh, sensitive data to websites, for example, if that's part of your security policy, you really can't do it with SSL because that's encrypted from the web browser all the way up to the web server. So how do you do that? One way is to uh, kind of decrypt it at a gateway and then re-encrypt it for the user on the other side. Well, the creating problem... Creating your own man cre in the middle. Creating your own man in the middle. The problem is that the browsers are smart and they notice that the, in, the second half of that communication is between the, the gateway and the, and the browser and the certificate that's used wouldn't match the server name in the certificate, okay? So we'd notice that, hey, I'm not talking to google.com, I'm talking to this, you know, web router dot internal host name dot company name dot com, and, and it would flag that, and you'd get a, 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 you know, this site's not trusted warning that you sometimes come across. And so if you looked at the actual error message that the browser would show you, it would be pretty obvious that something wasn't right. Now, a lot of people still say, oh, yeah, whatever, just click, go on, and bypass it. However, um, one way around that is to have your own CA, where you could sign these fake certificates that would look legitimate to the browser that the end, point, the, the end person would use. Okay, well, one way to do that is to create your own CA so you could do that and then push that CA certificate out to all the devices on your network. That's kind of hard to do, so people shortcut that and try to get an intermediate CA to sign their CA cert, which would allow them to create all these other certs that they would need to do this. Apparently, uh, this French uh, group that was trying to accomplish just that uh, lost control of their CA key that they created, their intermediate CA key. And by doing that, that allowed... Um, that could allow attackers to go and do the same thing, but do legitimate man-in-the-middle attacks and capture all the traffic in between these sessions. So this is not good. Um, and from a security perspective, as more and more websites provide SSL as the main way to communicate with them, look at Facebook or Twitter or Google, you know, they're all SSL-based now, from the gateway perspective, you can't see that traffic. You don't know, you only know the endpoints. You don't know what's in the, in the communication stream. So there's no way to do data loss prevention, for example. So if you're trying to make sure that your secrets aren't leaking out over the network, um, users could be uploading that to say their Google Drive, for example, because they gotta work on their documents at home, but yet it has a lot of sensitive information. You wouldn't be able to see that. By doing the man in the middle attack approach, it's one way to create a gateway that you can have the user uh, have their data decrypted at that gateway and then re-encrypted on the other side so you can check for that. That leads to a whole bunch of other issues uh, of privacy, but then you could also argue that they shouldn't be using their, uh, home, their browsers on the, on the corporate network to do personal things. So there's that issue as well. So I thought this was interesting because Google actually went in and modified their, uh, and basically revoked uh, this intermediate CA to prevent this from being a problem should somebody actually try to create their own man in the middle attacks for illegitimate purposes. So um, this is this is a very interesting um, thing. There there are these commercial devices that do that gateway function, but they kind of need either a CA that you've uh, set up and then push that CA cert out to all your devices, which is kind of hard to do if you're doing talking tablets and and phones, it's easier on the OS side, but tricking, or not tricking, but getting an intermediate CA to sign a CA cert for you, there's a whole bunch of security ramifications that can happen there, and so this is really an incident that, that is very serious, and I thought we'd talk a little bit about it. Well, the CA, <clears throat> the way the CA stuff works, there's a lot of trust involved, a lot of trust. Well, there has to be trust I mean, involved. Right, there has to be trust, but there's just this, 
implied trust. There's no... Right, right. The, the other problem is if you look at the average list of CAs included in any browser, it's over There's 100. A lot. So There's how a do lot. you trust every so, certificate that's there? There's a lot from foreign countries, from foreign companies. Uh, what, what level of trust well, do you I assign we, them? We, I think we did talk about this, but we have. There, there has been a few CAs, at least one that I know of, that was essentially given the death penalty. Yes. For CAs, which is you're not trusted in any And they take you browser. out of the CA list. And so you, you can no <laughs> yeah. longer, we, nobody ever trusts you. And that was uh, Digi Notar, I think. That was um, one, yep. So, uh, so it, it is, it, there is this trust, and it can be kind of enforced. If, if you are completely untrustworthy, you can be given the death penalty, essentially, by uh, being untrusted by all the major browsers, and then you're effectively left as you, you can't you're not an authority anymore right and then you'd have to get you'd have to convince the browser vendors to actually include you again later but I mean this seems this to me seems like a pretty significant breach of trust here and and, and, and Google just went as far as revoking the intermediary uh, CA and and didn't do anything further than that and I think this is essentially Saying this is this is your warning, right? And, and we so. should and we should say they didn't revoke the certificate because they couldn't revoke the certificate because they didn't sign it. Oh right. But they could go in and say don't trust that CA right, cert right. anymore. Right. So. And it was just an inter intermediary. intermediate. Yes. It wasn't. It wasn't actually the ANSSI certificate authority that ge that cr that that generated this intermediary certificate authority, but. Um, now, will all browsers honor that? Only, only, only Chrome. Only Chrome. So because yeah. Chrome's certificate revocation, and they put it in the metadata to say, yeah. Yeah, just you can verify, but don't trust it. Yeah. So well, the other, you know, if it does the, the other major browsers will continue just to. Yes, unless Firefox comes along and, and follows suit, which yeah. they just had an update to twenty six. So I don't know if that's been changed or not. Yeah. Well, I think we've talked about that in the past as well. How difficult to the list of trusted C I mean certificates they all come prepackaged with just a ton of them yes and yes I don't know how you, you were saying earlier you know you go through and you have to convince them to to trust you I don't know how difficult that process is because there's so many it's like is it really that complicated a process to get them to trust you as a CA you know to, to, to trust the certificates you're creating yeah, I don't know what the standard is yeah. that says you must meet these things to get in. Yeah, um, I'm okay. sure each browser or vendor has their own way of doing it, but uh, that is a good question. There's also some um, extensions for web browsers or add-ons or whatever you want to call them to verify a certificate every time you go to the site and tell you when this certificate is changed so you can actually yep. inspect the certificate and see, oh, like this certificate change, right? Is it still legitimate, or, or is there man in the middle, or, or whatever? I can't remember what off the bat what they're, what it's called, but um, there there is a there is an extension for Chrome, and I'm sure an add-on for uh, for Firefox to do that. So I think that 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 would that would help in this situation. It would let you detect it. Essentially, but those are really so, highly technical things that the average user is never going right. to come across. I mean, the fact is, that in your trusted certificate authority authorities within your web browser, I'm sure you will find government agencies from mm -hmm. various sure. countries yes. um, and things like that, which makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, don't. the fact that you, I see, you know, China or or whatever as a as a trusted certificate authority, I. I'd almost I don't like know. to see a solution where, you know, basically I only trust the ones I ever use, you know, so I go to a site and it, but it, it tells me, you know, everything looks good here, go ahead and say you want to trust this. And, and then it doesn't prompt you again. Maybe there is an you add-on to do that. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. I think there is an add-on to do that. It was, it was after uh, a few things, um, I can't remember who, who wrote it, but uh, somebody wrote a, a, I think an extension to do, because, to do that. Because, you know, it's like... So, you know, there's rare cases where you're gonna, you know, where you need to trust a certificate maybe from Turkey or whatever. You know, especially you're not doing anything there, you're not visiting those sites. So, if somebody uses it, compromises one of their certificates to sign it, make it look like you know it's signed as Google or something. It's like, 
I don't want to trust them as a CA necessarily because I'm never going to visit their stuff. So you could maybe cut off some of the the range these uh, man in the middle attacks would have. Because the, the thing is, the trick here is they're in that trusted list. If they can get somebody who's in that trusted list in the browsers, then they can all browsers will essentially just run it and trust it. So maybe maybe they can start doing things even by region, you know, somewhat. I mean, I know the internet's global. I mean, it's international, mm -hmm. and you know, you're not necessarily going to stay, you know, just on sites in the United States because you're within the United States. But maybe they can set up some rules. I, I do wish web browsers uh, would would do a little bit more as far as far as certificate authorities go. Um, in that you never used a certificate authority before. Do you want to trust this one? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to trust each individual certificate. Right, but do you want to trust certificate authority. authorities? Would be and you could go, why am I so, getting that? You know, all of a sudden, you know, yeah, when I first set up my account, yeah, I got all these questions. But, you know, I've been using this computer for a while. I'm visiting the sites I always visit. And all of a sudden, it comes up and says, do you want to trust this CA? I don't know. Maybe I want to call my IT guy and ask him. Because why would that all of a sudden pop yeah, up? You know, so, make it. Yeah, it, the only problem with that is it's going to be like uh, no script. Like every site yeah, you go to, it, 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 it is like say, you, know, should you want to run that JavaScript? Yeah. And there's a lot of users are going to say, or have tiers. I don't know. Of, Let's do it. Or you can have tiers of trust as well. Sure. I mean, I guess it, there's a tier one, they're always trusted. Yeah. There, there will be no. I guess I'm envisioning in maybe it. it wouldn't be as much, so many CAs. I mean, the problem with NoScript, I, I love NoScript, the problem with it is, you know, you go to a common website and there's like 50 JavaScripts running. Okay, man, that's an exaggeration. There's over 10. You have to say, yeah. you know, and a lot of times the page just looks, oh, and I'm like, well, I want to trust the one from its domain, but then there's all these third-party ones, but they use it for, like, their dynamic drop-down list and stuff. I have to go and figure out which one do I want to trust here. Um, I don't know if it would be that way with CAs, you know, so much. Maybe I'm wrong. I really don't know, but I would think there would be kind of this preset amount of CAs you would need to trust in doing your normal business. I mean, yeah, if you start visiting sites you've not visited before, you're probably going to get prompted and say, well, they're using this CA. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, just having the small list of trusted sites instead of the all-inclusive list of, well, we're going to trust everything that's within this list that you don't manage, we manage. Right. You know, the, what else would be nice is I don't, if you go into the Mac on the Keychain Access tool, there, it lists all the certs that are in there. You can add certs and all that. One of the things it has is the ability of extending trust to different functions. So you could say, I trust the CA to provide me with SSL certs, or I trust the CA to do SMIME. But I don't necessarily trust it for these other things. And you actually can go in and set the values for that, too. What would be nice is something equivalent. I think this would work for like Safari, which is the, the default Mac browser. But something similar like in Firefox or Chrome, where you could say, for this certificate authority, I only trust it to do these things. Like, yeah, you can do an SSL connection. Yes, I could trust it for SMIME or something like that. But maybe it's a little more granularity to say, I trust it to send data to me, but warn me if I'm going to be sending data to it. For example, yeah, that would be helpful. That'd probably be very difficult to implement, but it would be very It'd interesting be to have that level of granularity to say, I trust them to send me some data, but I don't necessarily trust it when I send data to it. Yeah, well, and, block that. At, to them. You know, and one of the things I can understand with the browsers, why they, you know, I know we were saying we wish they would do more, but you know, every little extra thing you do adds a little bit more to the time response, and, and they are competing with one another. Sure. And if you slow that thing down enough, um, people are gonna say, well, you know, I just don't think this is as good. You know, I don't think Firefox is as good as Chrome because I get a little faster response. Which I think is right why Chrome. near every browser doesn't check the revocation list right. when you go to sure. a website, because it slows it down a lot. It's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not just a small slowdown, it's a significant slowdown. So it's a nice thing to turn on, but it does slow down your web browsing to check the revocation, online revocation list every single time you go to a website. Well, you're checking for each site, though. So it's right. not you're super slow. Site. It depends right. on what you're, who you're talking to as right. well. But. And there's you check it for the certificate. Of, I mean, it, basically, each certificate has a link in it to the, the revocation list. And the web browser has an option, can go out to that 
uh, website and check to see if their certificate is revoked. That's what their certificate Yeah, in this case, there. I don't know if that would work because they modified the metadata for the cert for the certificate authority cert. So they didn't they didn't revoke it because they right. didn't they That's didn't true. generate it. That's true. So they had a way of yeah, pushing so it's, out it's more of a blacklist. Blacklist. And, and yeah, that would white be a better list. better example. So uh, yeah, the certificate would explicitly have to be on that list to be. And so revoked. what I'm asking for is a user interface to let me go in and say, yeah, put that one on the blacklist. Yeah. Put that one on yeah. the whitelist. That sort of thing. So yeah. the, and maybe you can. There might I, be an I think extension you can, I think for that. You, I think you can do that. Now, of course, you have to, I think, already accepted the certificate in order to blacklist the certificate. <laughs> so you have to accept the certificate. Which is kind of, kind of funny, really. You can think it, uh, I know in, uh, in Chrome on Windows, which uses the uh, built-in Windows uh, certificate, Manager, there's a way to click, click specifically click things and say don't trust this, but it has to be in within the it has to already be within your certificate store. So if you haven't accepted it already, then it's not gonna. But you can untrust certificate authorities by clicking them. Right. So anyway, one more thing that. we can talk about is uh, the uh, and I'm not sure if you were going to talk about this or not is the um, is the uh, certificate transparency um, system oh, that the, uh, yeah. Google was talking about in their blog post, which is basically um, instead of a revocation list, it's like we generated this certificate. And oh, each just certificate that gets generated, thing they generated is goes to a list essentially, so that so that people or companies like Google can look at the list and look for any certificates that were generated that they didn't generate. I mean, right. this again requires trust. It requires the certificate authorities to use it, right. and if not all of them use it, then it's kind of somewhat somewhat not very useful. So it'd just be another layer of of. I guess assurance that no certificates were generated without their permission. Sure. So I think it's a, I think it's a good idea, but it, it, it doesn't solve all the problems. But it, but it, but yeah, it requires it essentially requires all certificate authorities on a trusted list to use it, or it becomes not useful. Yeah. In my opinion, so I, I think it would be a good thing to see implemented, but I it seems like the uh, the overhead might be a little bit too much for some of the some certificate authorities to change their their ways essentially is, is what we well, require. Well, there's I mean, probably some business reasons. I mean, for Google not could it Google too. could threaten them as well. Say, well, if you don't use the, use this uh, transparency list, then you're not going to be trusted within Chrome. Yeah, <laughs> sure. They could only I mean, do that, I think, if they got the biggest players. Right. I mean, right. they could get the majority. Yeah. You know, if they could get over fifty percent big players. They could say, well, we'll do this because the small guys will either follow suit or just will fall out, but. If they can't hit that mark, they're not going to do that. Right. Because right. people would say, well, I'm just not going to use Chrome then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, it, it, yeah, they got and the, it, or the Or the all the browsers would have to kind of, all the companies that make browsers would right. have to kind of all say the same thing. Cause then, right. But it's yeah. Google's initiative, so they probably right. just wait to see how. Yeah. yeah how, I, I, they, they could say, well, you know, Google's going to force you to do that. Over here at Microsoft, we're not going to force you to right. do that. Right. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, I think we've we've gone on for long enough about it. So, uh, so thanks to Mike Hill and Keith Watson. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.